Hi guys, I passed the 107 with a 90%. This is the post-test car interview that everyone traditionally does. I didn't pay for any course, just studied the FAA study guide and watched a bunch of online videos. And if you watch this video, you'll learn everything you need to know to pass your 107. Yeah, don't waste your time doing practice tests. Just learn the material. Know your airspace, know your risk management, and your frequencies, and you'll probably pass. A lot of those practice questions, none of that was on my test. Everyone wants to say, use these practice tests, and I totally disagree, because and you don't need to pay hundreds of dollars to take this. Everything you need to know is in that FAA study guide. All you got to do is read it. Remember, there's only three questions, and and you only have to get a 70. Okay, once you successfully complete the test on the PSAs, as soon as you take your test results, you have to transfer it from PSI to the FAA's website. And something that no one tells you on any of the videos I have watched is you have to complete a background check. The FAA is going to do a background check on you, which can take up to 10 days before you'll be issued your temporary airman certificate. And then it can take up to two months before you get your plastic. I'm going to do the post-test talk in the car like everyone does. You know, a little disappointed at 90%. I I got aggravated at the trick questions. Several of them I didn't know. So the following is what was on the test. So I studied for a long time on METARs and TAFs. I only had two questions. One question was on a TAF and one was a METAR. One question was how long is the TAF valid for? The other one I really don't remember what the other one was. It, it was ridiculously simple. Um, some trick questions about where a ceiling starts, and they use terms I didn't know. A lot on loading the aircraft. If you put weight, there was three questions on center of gravity and loading the aircraft. If you put the weight behind the aircraft, what's it going to do? High bank turns, uh, what's that going to do to your aircraft? Tons and tons and tons. I mean, like... 15 questions on risk management. I wasn't sure whether to hit, they had a bunch of other terms and I really just skimmed through all that through the book. Matter of fact, let's go look at it. There was a couple questions on that. Um, standard temperature and if the temperature was above standard temperature, how will that affect your aircraft? There were questions on weight. There were two or three questions on weight. If you put the weight behind the center of gravity, there were a couple questions on adding a light and if you, about how much weight you could add. How adding weight past the center of gravity, how will that affect the performance of the plane? All right, I had one question on that, which is pretty simple because they give you the chart to the side one question it's the only question i used a calculator for there was a question on this load factor in steep turns emergency there was a question on that when can you deviate from part 107 i'm just i'm trying to do this when it's fresh in my mind because i'm gonna i'm fast gonna forget it so there were 12 questions i bookmarked oh what frequency if the tower does not have, if the airport does not have a listed frequency, what frequency will, should the planes communicate on? You better know your frequencies. There were some questions on that. Temperature and what it's going to do to common sense questions on alcohol. I didn't have any on that. I don't know if I should go through this or not. I did have a couple questions on the hazardous attitudes. I think two. The risk management, they had a whole bunch of other terms. And I didn't know if I should put CRM, ADM. I don't know. It's, you know, they're one on emergency procedures. The two questions, should you contact the landowner or have alternative landing strip? Or I forget what the next one was. This is your ADM, and I didn't study any of that. Like I said, it was mainly, there was some on that, stress and work overload too. I would say the majority of my test was this. It was finding towers, how far you had to measure your towers, and you could add 400 to it and see if you could operate if you could fly some of the towers were actually into class charlie airspace some weren't some were in delta some weren't 
So, and you need to know Class E airspace pretty good too. I did not have a single, not a single longitude and latitude question. Not a one. I did have four questions regarding flying over people and remote ID. Uh, one question upon class one, class two, the four classes of drones and asking questions about that and flying over people. And I don't know about what, what class two do you have to have? What do you got to have on a class two drone to fly over people? None on this military, none, none, nothing on military. Okay. I did have one VR. But tons of stuff on ceilings. A trick question on, it was a trick question, but it was basically coming down to what your, the only minimum, well, what was the minimum to fly a drone? Basically, it was a trick question. It was talking about an airport, but sheer uh, questions on shear, where can shear occur? And like I said, there were questions on this angle of attack and adding weight to the aircraft. Well, there was a couple questions about fog and when that's going to occur but it's sort of surgeon sort of generic i did not get one single question on stable air and unstable air that everybody talks about there there was two questions on this and i'm not sure if i got them right or not the ceiling for aviator purposes a ceiling is the lowest level of clouds reported as being broken or overcast or vertical visibility yeah that yeah okay i got it right but they were th throwing out these terms that I weren't sure. Uh, I think one of them about loading the aircraft had to do with your takeoff. Effects on the wings of an airplane. I mean, we're flying drones, right? Oh well. So anyways, guys, it wasn't really that hard. My prep, I was saying you should study this, but what you're going to actually be asked is one question out of here. Actually, my question's answer was right there. Had to do with timing and I forget what the other one about. Instead of wasting your time with practice test, download the test booklet off the FAA's website. You will find it there. Go through it, okay? You need to learn this, memorize it, okay? It will be in your test booklet. Some advice I have, something I wish I would have done. I had heard this advice before bring a FAA approved magnifying glass where they put me during the test was a really dark cubicle between two fluorescent lights and I was having a really hard time seeing this and if I would have had a magnifying glass especially the the charts the charts are picked it's not an actual chart it's a picture in a book and I was having a hard time in the darkness at this test cubicle reading some of this stuff I could have I got at least five or six questions you can figure them out by looking at the legend there's a lot of information in here that you can use when you're asked when you're taking the test Okay, this is going to be on the test. It's the only time I used a calculator. You will have at least one question from this. So I was trying to figure out. So you need to go and print off this right here. Here's your TAF, your question. This is the TAF that's going to be in the book. So if there's anything here that you don't know, I mean, this is the... This is the question they're going to ask you. It's either going to be this one or this one. So you need to know what all this means. Like I said, I only get, got two questions on METARs and TAF. Where's the METAR? Okay, here's the METAR that's going to be on the test. You're going to have a question from this. So you need to know what all of this means or be able to figure it out. If you go through, you don't need to learn. If it's not on this right here, you don't need to memorize it, but you probably need to know what RA, what BR, what scattered 15 statutory miles, what SKC means, but all of your, there was at least two questions on this chart right here, or sectional. This one here, this was on there. So be familiar with it. Uh, two or three questions were on this one. So be familiar with this guide, go over it. You're going to need to know about center of gravities and center of pressure and adding weight. So you can actually go through the actual test booklet and they're going to say, they're going to ask you a question about a tower. And as you can see, the print is really small and having a magnifying glass would be quite helpful. 
but they're going to ask you to measure like for instance they're going to say something about a tower so far from here you need to know what this means and you need to know what this means and what this means and the bands of your airspace here you need to know you need to know your airspace really well I mean we're talking 15 20 questions are going to be about airspace you better be able to decipher this right here this here this here drone coach has a really good graphic that if you haven't memorized it already you really should you need to know the difference between class C and class G airspace and know that one's controlled and one's uncontrolled you need to know the difference between it what goes up there and there there are some questions about that and that you need to know refer to in the airspace it will be helpful to know that class D airspace is has a radius of five miles or 10 miles across and your stair stepping of your upside down wedding cake that's five miles that's 10 miles you also need to know that that's MSL and class B is going to go up to 100 MSL unless otherwise noted you need to know the maximum speed of a drone is 87 knots or 100 miles per hour I believe the only thing you really need to know on that is you must have a minimum of three miles of visibility so you're gonna have a lot of questions there'll be like a tower that's going like that and you need to know if you can fly that tower without ATC authorization or what if the tower is here what if the tower goes like that because typically you can fly 400 feet above a tower and that's going to put you into class C airspace so you're going to have to fill figure all that out see drone coach is giving you this right here telling you that you know you got a tower here but you can fly up to if that tower is a thousand feet across you can fly up to 1400 feet but where's that going to put you if if you're going to be penetrating that airspace right there but you're going to have lots of questions 20 percent of my test probably was on airspace and airspace authorizations can you operate a drone if you are not concurrent if your 107 is not current can you operate with the supervision of someone who is what is covered in the 107 they kept talking about civil civil and public what is the flash sequence for anti-collision light at night what do you do if your anti-collision lights go off how much weight can you put on your drone like adding speakers or cameras if you're letting someone else fly your drone and they've been drinking within so many hours are they allowed to fly if you crash your drone what do you have to do if you crash and burn your drone what do you do about the drone registration do you have to report your drone if you crash it but don't damage any other property category one flying over people what is the requirement a little bit there was one on setting your drone up using a bright light and then what should you do like I said lots of stuff on risk management what is autonomous crew resource management the blue line which is a, a flight path and it had a a blue square underneath of it when I looked in the ledge and I saw that is the distance in between your VOR spots it's mileage how far between so yeah I know what Unicom and Multicom is I'd, I'd just I'd memorize those 122 frequencies, 122 frequencies just memorize them. Right away, if you're flying around an airport, what's the right away for aircraft in the air and on the ground? They had you look up an airport. 
that was in Colorado. It did have flight services and a, um, a rotating beacon, but it did not have a control tower frequency. And the question was about, can you operate your drone at that airport when there was no there was no classified airspace if it's a part-time class D airport in other words it's got the C after on your frequency you'll have your CT dash the control tower frequency and then you will have a blue C and a star one of the questions wanted to know what the blue C was for and another question wanted to know about it's a class D airspace airport class D airspace around the airport but the control tower shuts down at noon shuts down at dark is it still a class D airport? Does it remain class D or does it go to class E and G if the control tower is not operational? If the temperature goes up, does your drone, does its efficiency go up or down? So I really, it, three fourths of the stuff I studied was not on there. The Tony's awesome video, all that stuff about separations was not on there. All those distances was not on there. When do you, when can you deviate from part 107? So if you're flying, you have authorization to fly, but an aircraft is headed your way, what are you supposed to do? So I would say that three-fourths of the questions, if you knew your airspace and knew your risk management and you knew your frequencies, common sense, you would pass the test. Well, there's 60 questions and it took me an hour and it took me less than an hour and then I spent about 20 minutes going through the questions that I had bookmarked. They do almost strip search you going in. You gotta lock everything in a locker. You can't even take your billfold in. One of the recommendations somebody had on a YouTube channel, and I do recommend it, is to bring a magnifying glass. And my other complaint, which I complained about um, after the test, was she had me I was like in between fluorescent lights and I was having a it was the booklet was really dark I was having a, a, a really hard time seeing the booklet in the fine print you got a, they're not giving you an actual chart they're giving you a booklet that's got pictures of the chart where so the legends actually smaller than what it normally is on the legend on an actual sectional chart. I didn't have any of those questions on, I didn't have any about runway patterns, approaches, any of that stuff. Left, right hand, downwind, crosswind, base, final. I didn't have any of those questions. There's no reason to memorize all those abbreviations in METAR and TAFs either none of that stuff was in there. Like I said, I, I didn't have any longitude and latitude, didn't have a single question. And I, I didn't, I was going to use it to measure, but I didn't. I just went to the ruler at the top of the page with your piece of paper. The only math question was, it was like a 400, it was like a 400 foot tower and you can go 400 feet above that 400 so that would be 800 feet and you were in class you were under a class C airspace there was a really difficult one you know the height of the the lowest shelf and it was like in a like Dallas 
class B airspace that had all kinds of airports under it and that one was real difficult because you were in between class D airspace and it was hard to see where the what does your remote ID transmit when you put your remote remote ID on what's it gonna do when do you turn it on there was another quick trick question about remote ID and I think what they were gonna do is these my drone doesn't have a remote ID but I think what they're gonna try and do is do it through software through the controller and the question was it was something about that using the your pre underway check there was a question about that there was a question about class 2's certificate of compliance and flying over people I had a question about I think there was 12 that I bookmarked and when I went back some advice when I went back I went back through there like twice and I saw that I had 12 bookmarked but I couldn't remember how many you were allowed to take and at this point I was getting real aggravated because I was getting aggravated at the blatant trick questions I mean they were just they were trying to trick you up I had 12 bookmarked but when I went back I only changed I think I changed one of my answers otherwise I kept going through them and I just left them and then I was aggravated I, I just went ahead and submitted my test I forgot how many I was allowed to miss but um, I mean I, I knew I had passed at that point and it's like what difference does the score really make you know yeah I'd like to get a hundred percent I could brag about it I did get a ninety percent which if it wasn't for the trick questions I would have gotten a hundred percent so your general test taking skills you can more or less, you have a 50 50 percent chance on most of the questions because one of them is just totally wrong. And then your others, a lot of them would be above ground level or um, MSL or AGL. So, like I said, you better know your, you better memorize um, that airspace. I think it's drone school or somebody has a really really good graphic of airspace that more than what the FAA does and you more or less need to memorize that I got tired of I scheduled my exam two days ago I got tired of studying for it and watching YouTube videos and like I said I did not take any course I mean if, if you're a pilot and you know airspace you could probably pass this test with guessing I don't know just hurried up and scheduled it went took it on my day off it was gonna be a rainy day so I couldn't go hunting or trapping or any of the fun things in life if you guys want my notes um, I will make them available good luck guys good luck the effects of caffeine and alcohol you need to know that and effects of decongestants so here's my notes right here minimum weather is three miles Precip precipitation static full corona static you're gonna hear static on the radio thermal plumes such as smokestacks there's no tums there's bird tan bird dumbs snow tams and ash tams like a volcano explodes uh, 1-800-weatherbrief.com aviationweather.gov tfr.faa.gov high pressure systems are going to go clockwise low pressure systems going to go counterclockwise for every thousand feet that you go in elevation temperature is going to drop 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 2 degrees Celsius every 20 feet every 20 degrees doubles the amount of water that air can hold your standard air pattern is a left-hand turn 
There's your right, okay? You got your downwind, base, final, crosswind. Unicom is for ordering fuel or ordering rental cars. ASO is pre-recorded weather briefings. Runways are always in magnetic north. Towers, the first number is MSL. The next number is above the ground. If you see a UC, that means they're under construction. A dashed magenta is class E airspace. Airspace is always in mean scene level. The ASOS refers to auto surface observation system. It's a generic METAR. When you're doing your latitude, if you need to measure on the test, you can use your latitude scale and each tick mark is one mile. One mile is one, to, um, one minute of latitude. AWOS is what private airports will use. It's an auto, auto weather observation system. Learn that figure 12 and 13 in the supplement. If you see a RAB 35, that means rain began 35 minutes after, after the hour. You can fly over towers. You can fly up to 400 feet over a tower, but you can't go into airspace. Clouds must be 2,000 feet below, or 2,000 feet side to side, or 500 feet below the clouds, not closer than 2,000 feet laterally. The ceiling is defined by the lowest level of unbroken clouds. PAVE is an acronym for RISC. It stands for Pilot Aircraft Environmental External Pressure. PAVE. Pilot, aircraft, environment, or external pressures. Uh, you might want to know the radius of class C airspace. The radius of most airspace is five miles for each circle. Class D is five miles from the airport to the outer ring. Then your class B and C. Class B is going to have two rings, so it's going to be 10 miles and class B is going to have three rings, so it's going to be a 15-mile radius. First thing you do when you get in there is use your paper as a ruler. Take your, go to your longitude and latitude lines and or on the bottom there, the scale, and mark it off on your paper. Humidity decreases your aircraft's performance. Um, a dash magenta means not towered. Your air on your airports. CT means control tower. That's your frequency. If you see a star, that means part time. And when the tower is closed, that number is referred to as your CTAF, which is your common traffic advisory frequency. Density altitude, pressure goes up, density of air goes up, aircraft performance goes up, density altitude down. Okay, those are your variables. So if your temperature goes up, your density of your air is going to go up, your aircraft performance is going to go down. Increase in altitude, your altitude goes up, your density of air is going to go down, your aircraft performance is going to go down, and hence the density altitude goes up. Humidity causes a decrease in density of the air. Your aircraft performance is going to go down and your density altitude goes up. You must register your drone every three years. The center, center of gravity is really, made, really only going to affect your aircraft at low speeds. At high speeds, think of an F-15 and all the tricks they can do at high speed. Your airports are magnetic. You're going to add a zero to the direction of the airport. So runway 13 is really runway 130 magnetic going down. Runway 4 is going to be 40 degrees magnetic going that way. Remember, planes always land into the wind. And if there's more than one runway, they're going to be left, center, and right. And so runways are numbered from 1 to 36. Your standard day conditions are sea level is 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's 29.92 millimeters miller, of mercury or 1013.2 millibars. 
Your density altitude is the changes from this. This is your standard day conditions and your density altitude is, is that going up or down? If your density goes up, your density altitude goes up, the density of air goes down, so your air care performance. What are the following reasons that could cause a NOTAM to be issued? PAVE stands for pilot, aircrew, environment, external factors. All right, 500 feet below the clouds, 2,000 feet from the clouds, 2,000 feet from guide wires. 100 miles per hour is the max you can go in your drone. Must have a minimum of three statute. Must have a minimum of three statute miles. You must register your dr drone if it's 0 0.55 to 55 pounds. Uh, 13 years of age to register a dr drone. 16 years of age to take the test. Eight hours since your last alcohol and your blood must be below 0.04. You must wait one year after a narcotics conviction. If you do more than $500 in damage, you must file an accident report with the FAA within 10 days. Once again, your airport. Here we're on final. Your runway's going this. The wind's going to go this way. That's downwind. That's your base. That's your final. That's departure. Crosswind. Planes usually come in at a... Planes are going to come in at a 45 degree angle. Go into the downward downwind leg. Make a left turn, then they're going to go down the base, make another left turn, and then they're going to land. And if they're doing a touch and go, they're going to then the departure leg. This is a left-hand runway. This is a right-hand runway. How do you operate in an MOA? Operate in extreme caution in an active MOA. Section X of the supplemental chart will tell you what to find, what kind of activity is taking place in there. You must show your 107 certificate and an ID to any authority that asks for it. What is, what is the purpose of the rudder? It's to change the, the yaw. In other words, your rudder goes here, make it go like this. Sealing a cloud cover, lowest a broken or overclass, but not thin. What are the only kind of clouds mentioned on a TAF? They're broken. METAR, question, RAB 35 means rain began 35 minutes after the hour. Your lines, lines of latitude, you're going to see your one line's going to be numbered. Here we got a 98. Then every tick mark is one to one minute and you're going to have a larger tick mark at 10. So we're going to have our long line going the length of the chart. Then we're going to go 10, 20, 30. Okay, but there's not going to be any number on 30, 40, 50, 60, and then there will be another number on that one. They grow up, they go from, the numbers go up from east to west, Greenwich, Greenwich, England, equator zero. And that's it, guys. If you memorize that, you will pass your 107. Highlights from the study manual. A, B, and C and D airspace is all mean sea level. But class E airspace is above ground level. It either has a ceiling. It begins at 700 feet AGL or 1,200 feet AGL. And goes all the way up to 1,800 feet. The reason for that is for IFR conditions and to keep separation. Class B airspace is a surface to 10,000 feet. Class C airspace is the surface to 4,000 feet. The outer ring is 10 nautical miles. Class D airspace, once again, it's five miles radius from the airport. It's a surface to 2,500 feet above the MSL, above the airport. Class E airspace, which we were just talking about. Okay, you can't fly an A, B, C, or D without AT, ATC authorization. Okay, class E you can. Okay, but class E is the majority of the United States. There's all kinds of stuff about it here. Class G airspace is totally uncontrolled. Prohibited areas are highlighted with a P and 4, and you can look at the chart supplement for what the 40 means, P40. That's prohibited. You cannot enter it. National Mall, Camp David, the examples they give. Restricted areas have the R's there. Okay. Warning areas, three nautical miles outwards from the coast. 
you have your military operation areas, MOAs, alert areas, and they have A dash and then the number to look it up in the supplement, controlled flying areas, and that's and then you have all your like parachuting stuff. But anyways, so another interesting thing, a lot of national parks you cannot fly a drone. And as you can see here, you can't get within 2,000 feet of, at the, above the ground level. We have tethered balloons that can go up to 60,000 feet. Military training routes. I think you're probably going to see a question on that. You get the IRs and the VRs. VRs are for visual flight rules. IRs is instrument flight rules. And they can be going up to 200 knots in speed. And you're just going to see them on the chart there and the, the designations. Okay, we have the TFRs. They're gonna be in the no toms flight, flight restrictions. We have bird TAMs, bird TAMs. We've got, I think I went through that already. Okay, weather, we have METARs. Like I said, the best thing for you to do is go through this page and read this page, try and figure it out. But you print out, here's all your definitions and you print out the page that's going to be in the book and they can still get you on questions because this is crazy that you need to memorize all this stuff. TAFs are your terminal air dome forecast and they are reported for a five mile radius around the airport and it's valid for 24 to 30 hour time period and they do they update it four times a day. Uh, if you see a prob 30 that means a 30% probability of thunderstorms. Density altitude. As the density of air increases, which produces a lower density altitude, your aircraft performance increases. The close, lower you get to the ground, also it's going to increase. That's the way I try and remember it. Air density, air density decreases, higher density altitude, your aircraft performance decreases. High density altitude refers to the thin air while low density altitude refers to dense air. Increasing the temperature of a substance decreases its density. Water vapor is lighter than air. Moist air is lighter than dry air. Relative humidity. Once you get 100% re relative humidity, no more vapor can be held in the air. If weight is added to an aircraft, it must fly at a higher angle of attack to maintain a given altitude and speed. Low wind shear, 